This reception is such an inspiration to me. The events that I have been blessed to be a part of happened as part of life unfolding and opportunities that have presented themselves. This honor has made me reflect on God's direction for my life and how I can use who I am to help others and to make Maryland or wherever I am a better place. I never realized how passionate I am. I wish all of my Leo club and family could be recognized also. This evening teaches me to always go the extra mile, literally, and that if I believe it, I can achieve it. Thank you too for making community service and acting on concern for others such a priority. Service to others is the key to our future. This evening has turned that key to an on position. Thank you. I hope you all are doing well tonight. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm almost speechless. Um, I just feel so honored even to be nominated for this award, and I would like to thank uh, the, the co-chair commission of the Anne Arundel County Commission for Women, Angie Rodriguez, for nominating me. Um, she served as an inspiration to me as I continue to pursue um, political endeavors within the state. Um, but going on from that, I have to thank, of course, my father and my brother who are here tonight, and most importantly, my mother. <laughs> Especially my mother at that, given that when I accept this award, I feel as though I am furthering her legacy and everything that I do is because of what she's taught me. <laughs> and she is one of the most kindest people I've ever met. And so... <laughs> oh my gosh, so silly. <laughs> <laughs> to receive an award as a Maryland Renewal tomorrow. And first, I would like to thank my amazing guidance counselor, Ms. Belamosi, for nominating me, for always supporting me, and always being there to be my best <laughs> Secondly, even though my mentor, Dr. Bernie, couldn't be here today, I wanted to thank him because he gave me an opportunity to intern at his lab and I learned a lot and through research, I was able to give back to my community and um, assist the lab as well in any way I could. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank my family for always supporting me through my endeavors. To my mom, I love you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for being such an amazing role model and for teaching me that education is the key to success from such a young age. And to my sister, I would like to thank you for always supporting me and always making me laugh. <laughs> and lastly, I want to thank the commissioners for um, um, choosing me for this award and let you know that this award will continue to inspire me every single day to do the best that I know I can. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, for everything. Because without him, without faith in him, many times we don't have the courage, nor do we want to put forth the effort to do what is innately within us. So that's the first person I want to thank. <laughs> Secondly, I want to thank the Commission for Women who recognize leadership and to recognize the things that we are doing every day. Sometimes not for any recognition, but we're doing it because we are mothers, we are comforters, we are teachers, we are fathers sometimes, because we wear many hats, and we do it with pride, with little complaint. So I want to thank every one of you for selecting me, the selection committee, the chair, and I interact with uh, Mrs. Judith, Vaughn Franklin. Just a wonderful, wonderful, nice, caring. Sometimes the person you interact with are the windows to the soul of your organization. 
then you got to be careful who answers your phone. <laughs> As I used to say to my secretary that I'm here this place, answer the phone with sunshine. <laughs> that may be our next hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> in your voice. I want to thank next Dr. <coughs> Valencia Campbell and the Prince George's Policy, Drug Policy Coalition for selecting me. Now Dr. Campbell met me at a book signing, Dr. Hempstead. And she saw something in me. And when she told me she was gonna select me for this, I said, what? You never know who knows you who's watching what you do. And that coalition, I never met many of those people. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, and all of your coalition for nominating me, sight unseen, and looking at the work that you do. So that is a blessing, and I thank you so very much. In accepting this award, I do not accept this award for Hattie Washington. I accept this award on behalf of my village of supporters who have helped me to raise those fine young men at Unhattie's place. Over 20 years, actually 25 years, that I started in my home as a foster parent. And Unhattie's place been open 20 years. And we have raised over 100 young men who have gone on from their special education. medication to straight A students graduating from Coppin State University. I want to thank the whole but all the persons who are here who are part of Unhattis Village have supported my friends, my family, please stand and recognize all of these village of support. Thank you so very much for what you do every day and all of the different organizations that they represent. My church, first of all, my pastor, Dr. Haywood A. Robinson, and our first lady. Would you please stand, Dr. Robinson? My entire church, the People's Community Baptist Church, have adopted my young men. And they see them, they don't just talk the talk, but they walk the walk. All of the different organizations, the National Council for Negro Women, I see those persons are here. We have the American Mothers International, I see some of those persons are here. My Leadership Maryland, Leadership Montgomery, Coppin State University, all of the different organizations are part of my village. But first I want to recognize my daughter, my two daughters, Sherelle, Dr. Sherelle Washington Thomas, who's in Florida, couldn't be here, and my baby girl, Cheryl Washington. Please stand, Cheryl. Cheryl's an attorney, and she's the first director of my hands place. Stop practicing law, but she really didn't, because you need the law to understand the coma regulations. <laughs> and was the executive director at minimum wage for six years. And she said, Ma, this is what the law put on my heart to do. I said, but I can't pay you what you went to law school for. She said, well, this is what the law put in my heart to do. So she's going to do it for two months, then two years, and six years. And now she's worked for the East Baltimore Development Corporation as the, as, as Dr. Burnett used to say, some, some, some big. <laughs> <laughs> but she's about to work the youngest CEO there. I want to recognize my handsome son. Stand up, Wayne. <laughs> Wayne is. is Graduated from Compensate, <coughs> computer genius. He's so good, he can work my computer from home his office. And I can see the little needle movies and my gadget. I got you on team view. I said, what's that? He's getting ready to go out to Boston. His job's going to send him to Boston. He just came from San Francisco. Just a fine young man. And he's a role model and comes back to mentor the other young men and say, if I did it, I was a foster kid. If I can do it, then you can do it as well. And so he gives them all the courage. So let's give him a hand to keep on. Then I just want to 
begin by recognizing all of our women who have done well, who are part of the Hall of Fame. I look at your bio. You are fabulous, fantastic, and I'm so happy you're getting your flowers now instead of when you can't smell them. And I want to commend the commission for doing that. Then I want to recognize all of the young people because the young people are leading the world. The young people don't know, we don't know how well they think because we talk that we up to them. And these young people, I just want you to know you are leading the movement. You are leading the Me Too. You're leading, kids will lead them. Black girl magic. Black lives matter. Women matter. And I look at those young people in Parkland, Florida, how they're speaking up and standing up. You are our leaders now. And you're on your way to do big things in this country. And I want to recognize you. You are, remind me of the young people that were in Farmville, Virginia in 1951 uh, when they went on strike at our, our Moulton High School, which led to the Brown versus Board of Education. And so therefore, they were children who were part of that case. And these young people remind me of that. So keep on doing what you do. I'd like to close by saying, when you're planning for a year, you plant grass. When you're planning for 10 years, you plant a tree. But when you're planning for the future, you save, educate, motivate, and support the children. And that's what the women's commission I see doing. Thank you very much for this program. with PositivelyGospel.com and I'm here at the 2018 Maryland Women's Hall of Fame induction ceremony and right now I'm here with Dr. Valencia Campbell. How are you today Dr. Valencia? I am fine and it's so great to see you again. It's wonderful to see you too and I, know, I understand that you played a very big part in what happened here today that you nominated one of the honorees. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, I had the opportunity to nominate Dr. Hattie Washington for the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame, mainly because I was so impressed with all the things that she's been doing. Not just the uh, academic work that she's done, but her role as a founder of our campus place. And that place was just amazing. She started three new homes. And what she was trying to do was get the young boys who had no idea so much. So I remember all kinds of problems. And she took an interest in them, brought them in so that they had life. And she was taking them to the drugs, the abuse, all kinds of things that you can think of that happened to our young black people that she gave so unselfishly of her spirit, her heart, her funds, and everything. And to me, that's what it's all about. As many people are saying, it's not just to get an award, but you are actually out there making a difference in someone's life. Wonderful. I would certainly agree. And what would you say to, the, to other women, young women? I would be encourage all of the young women who are out here who are looking at folks like Dr. Patty, folks like Dr. Linda Robinson, all of these other women who were nominated to just look at them as role models, do the thing that they're passionate about because they never know who's looking at them and who will be nominating them for some of these outstanding awards. That's right, you never know. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with me today. This is Sarah Hearn, PositivelyGospel.com. Hi, this is Sarah Hearn with PositivelyGospel.com, and I'm here with Hall of Fame inductee Dr. Rita Robinson, and she's backed by these lovely ladies from her sorority, Zeta Phi Beta. Hello, ladies. Hello. Hi. So, Dr. Robinson, I'm sure that you're very honored tonight for what went to place. Why don't you tell me what this honor actually means to you? It means a lot to me. Um, education has always meant to me. I learned in mind as my mom who never had the chance to finish college and one of her greatest uh, wishes was that I would go to college. And so with her and her encouragement, I was the first person in my family to go to college and graduate. 
So that opened the door for everybody else. Now everybody goes to college. It's just a normal <laughs> process, you know, from nieces, nephews, cousins, and what have you. And I think education is so very important because it opens the doors for so many other opportunities. And, you know, being in organizations, and especially in organizations uh, like my sorority, which really does outreach work to help those who are needed to, to do a lot of so serious types of things. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. So tell me, what would you say to young women uh, who are out there that are striving and trying to do their best be in education or some other endeavor? What would you give them based on the wisdom that you've learned through the years? You know, I think one of the things I would say to young people, especially young women, is to get involved. You know, make that effort to know someone, to know another woman. It could be their teacher, it could be their counselor, it could be their parents. But at least make that contact and look at the world and see what it, how can I fit into that world? What, is, what are my passions? What are the things that I like to do? And then follow that. Um, I think that there's so many opportunities that are out there now, and if you can find yourself a mentor, I think it's really good. Fantastic. Well, you've heard it here from Maryland Hall of Fame honoring Dr. Rita Robinson, along with her Zeta Phi Beta sisters. This is Sarah Hurt with PositivelyGospel.com. PositivelyGospel.com. And I'm here with Dr. Hattie Washington. Our Aunt Hattie. Yes. If you would. We're, we're here today at the 2018 Maryland Women Hall of Fame induction, and Dr. Washington is an honoree. And she has done so much. Um, in her lifetime, I, I'm just so impressed. So why don't you tell me a little bit about Aunt Hattie's place? Well, Aunt Hattie's place uh, is a home for foster boys, and we started in 1997 to keep foster boys. I first started in my home as a foster parent, and then when I found out the kids had behavior, learning problems, they needed counseling, and other types of things, and I decided to open a home for foster boys have 24-7 supervision, then we could provide the counseling and the other activities for the boys. So it took me three years to go through the Comar regulations, which shouldn't take that long, but it's just cumbersome. It worked for my daughter, who was in law school at the time, to assist with the Comar regulations. I probably wouldn't have opened it, but it took us three and a half years because I was working full time. Um, started as assistant superintendent, then I ended up as the vice president of Coffee, so those were very uh, time-consuming jobs, but I still had in my heart to give back and help foster kids. That's, that's just wonderful. And what, what I also know is that you're, you're doing that, but you're also an educator. I guess that may have been your first love. Why do you think education is so important? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I started in a two-room schoolhouse wow. in Virginia. Tell me a little bit about that. And the two-room schoolhouse in Green Bay, Virginia, which was Prince Edward County, ended up closing in 1959 because of the Brown versus Board of Education and Virginia's resistance to integrating the schools. So rather than to integrate the schools after the Brown versus Board of Education was passed, they resisted, so therefore my school caught up into that, so it was closed in 1959. And I was 11 years old and in the fifth grade. And I was sent away from home to live with strangers in Norfolk in order to finish my education. So really, I became a foster kid. It wasn't at that time, you didn't have to go through the foster care system. Somebody just kept you. And so, but I was basically a foster kid. And so I had an affinity in my heart for foster kids and when I became assistant superintendent of schools in Baltimore City and saw kids on the corner in the middle of the day and being from the country in the old school where everybody talked to everybody, I just stopped the car one day and said, excuse me, why are you out of school? They said, who are you? I said, I'm the assistant superintendent and you stand on my streets in the middle of the day. So I'm gonna ask you again, why aren't you in school? They said, we foster kids and we don't have a home so we don't have an address. So therefore, we don't know what school we're supposed to go to. So I took them in my car, took them back to the office, and called social service, and I ended up taking them home for one night, I thought, while they found them home. And then one night became one week, and one month, and one year. 
and then I decided to open up a group home. So that's why I had that affinity for foster kids because I was somewhat of a foster kid myself. Well, you, well, you know what, I, what I'm hearing in, in your story because you said that uh, this happened from that two-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. and that there was a resistance to it, integration. Mm -hmm. And I think about the fact that nevertheless, you persisted. Persisted. You, you continued in your education and you not only continued in your education, but you spun that into helping others. So you yes. kind of you kind of created a, a spider web, if you will, to, to draw others in. Mm -hmm. So with your work at Coppin, which is an HBCU, yes. um, what role do you see the HBCUs continuing to fulfill for, for African Americans? Well, after I left the two-room schoolhouse and my teacher, Ms. Brown, had first grade to fourth grade in the same classroom. And she used the fourth graders to teach the second graders and third graders to teach the first graders. And I was used quite a bit to teach, even teach some of the higher fifth grade. And so I felt like a teacher. She kept telling me, you're a great teacher, you're a born teacher. So she's the one that motivated me in that two-room schoolhouse to be a teacher. And so that carried me through, became a teacher, went to Norfolk State, first one in my school, my home, my family ever gone to college. Didn't know you had to apply and you had to read my book, because I talk about it in my book, Driven to Succeed, an inspirational memoir of lessons learned through faith, family, and favor. And I talk about my story because much, many of my lessons were learned after the fact. Because when I'm born through it, when my father sent me away from home, I was hurt. It's like, well, why are you sending me out of town to stay with strangers? But my father saw that education was going to be my key. If I stayed around Farmville, Virginia, or Meharon, he knew the school was going to be closed for more than one year. So he thought he'd just go in and get the ball rolling and send me away from school. I was hurt at first, devastated, traumatized. But then later on, I learned so many lessons that people came into my life that I saw God give me people in my life who were my mentor mothers and fathers. And so teaching, once I taught special ed kids for years, and I knew I could reach special education kids, my college convinced me to come to Norfolk State to teach teachers. First I said, no, I want to teach my own kids. They convinced me that if you teach one teacher, look how many kids you can impact by teaching a teacher. So that's what I decided to do. So I taught at Norfolk State. Then I went overseas, because at that time my husband was in the military. Then I came back, worked at Maryland State Department for eight years, supervising superintendents. And then became assistant superintendent of Baltimore City, teaching principals how to teach teachers. And then came to Compton as the first female vice president. And then I was always a professor, even when I was a vice president. I wanted to teach teachers. And so all of that is like a, a full circle, trying to reach more kids. And with the unhappiest place, it's like the missing piece was the home. So if I could teach my teachers, and they're great teachers, but you got kids coming from all kinds of homes. So if I could keep some kids in a home, send them to my schools that I got teachers, and then send them to Coppin State, it's like a cyclical where you got the full circle. And so that was my aim to teach my boys and my boys home, go to my schools and then come to Coppin. And therefore, I had my hands on them all through there. So that's the whole mission. Wow. That's amazing. I, I hear a lot in your story. I also, I also hear you talking about your dad, and it sounds like even though, like you said, that was a it was a hurtful time, the lessons that he put into you, you basically you you've re repurposed and recycled them, and now you're pouring back into others. So, as an educator who's so interested in working and and is working with those who have special needs, is there any advice you would give to parents of children who do have special needs? Because, of course, sometimes. Um, there's some difficulties, there's challenges, there's frustrations. Um, what, what would you share with them? First of all, you got to find out if they are truly special education. I found out that 80% of my students I've taught over the years were not special education. There may have been behavior problems, but it was learned behavior. And many of the kids who are on medication don't really need to be on medication unless they have a neurological imbalance, and some kids do, and they do need medication. But the large majority of my boys had learned behavior, which meant that you could unlearn it. And with the right 
reinforcement and the high expectation and my strategies at work. So I use the same strategy I use for my two daughters. One's an attorney and one's a physician. So it's love, consistency, high expectation. And I have to first tell my parents find out if they are truly special ed, what does special ed mean? Behavior problem? Well, okay, if they're not sick, we can unlearn this behavior problem and I show parents how to do that. I use behavior, uh, behavior modification, etc. So I work with parents, have them to identify and have the teacher to identify the positive. Every child has gifts, even if you are special aid. So look at the gifts first and use your gifts to ameliorate some of the weak areas. And so I just have to teach them how to tell that the kids are truly special ed and what does special ed mean. That, that's quite a nugget that you've dropped. Unlearn the behavior. Um, we're going to shift gears as we come to an okay. end um, because you sort of mentioned it earlier, but Dr. Washington is also an author. She's also an author. She's written several books. So why don't you just briefly sum up some of the work that you've done in your books? Well, the first book is Driven to Succeed, and that book basically talks about my life journey whereby I go from a two-room schoolhouse now to the Hall of Fame. Uh, so very humbly in the country, and we found out that the schools were closing and I was sent away from home. I talk about basically what are my lessons that I learned through all of that. Regardless to the devastations in your life, your pitfalls, turn those roadblocks into detours and look at the glasses half full, not half empty. So I give people a, a positive perspective on themselves and life. Then I look at, I share how I raised my two daughters as a parent. And then I talk about my foster boys. What are my same strategies of raising difficult foster boys? And then lastly, I talk about divine interventions that happened in my life that I didn't know until later that God was carrying me with people in my life that I didn't know until later you look back and say, oh, that's why that happened. So the book pulls it all together and for inspiration of peace. I had a lady who said, I, I don't like reading. She said, I haven't read a book in 20 years. She said, but I read your book three times. So I said, that is testament to how inspired the book is. And they can, we can find your book on Amazon? And other uh, it, Amazon, uh, you just Google it, it's the Driven to Succeed. You can go to the publisher, you can go to my website, which is drhnwashington.com. That's my mm -hmm. website for okay. the book, and it can click you to wherever you can buy the book. A lot of other information on there. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. It has been such a pleasure talking with you, and congratulations again on your honor. Thank you. This is Sarah Hearn with Positively Gospel.